Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you. If uh, you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to open it up. If you don't have a Bible with you, I'd like to encourage you to find one quickly and uh, follow along with me. We're going to be looking into the uh, close to the very, very end of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, to understand what Jesus is talking about today, we're actually going to need to look at some other chapters within the Sermon on the Mount as well to pay attention to what it is that Jesus wants us to do. It's good to be with you. I'm Pastor Tim Brown, and I'm looking forward to um, uh, turning in the scriptures with you today. Uh, we are, are coming now very close to the end of our series on the Sermon on the Mount, probably the most famous sermon ever preached. And uh, we actually began back in September going passage by passage, verse by verse, through this portion of scripture. And uh, we've actually made it quite a long journey. And uh, looking forward to completing that. And then we've got some new exciting things coming up in the month of June after we finish up this, the, the, uh, the very final message of the Sermon on the Mount next week. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn right now to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. And uh, listen as I read this, uh, the word of God. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for these, your words. Thank you for the vivid illustration that you've given us, and we ask that you will help us not just to admire it, but to live into it. Help us to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. For your name's sake, for your kingdom, for your glory, we ask. Empower us to both hear and do your word today by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning I have a bit of a humorous confession to share with you. Uh, a number of weeks ago, uh, I was looking at uh, choosing a workout uh, routine to do, and uh, my wife and I have subscribed to a workout video series. And so while I was eating my breakfast, I just decided to open up the workout videos and go ahead and look at which one I was going to do. And I wasn't too sure what was in a particular one, so I just kind of opened it up and pushed play while I'm eating my eggs and sipping on my coffee. And wouldn't you know, before I'm done eating my breakfast, uh, the workout video is done, and I hadn't worked out one moment. And I, it was about time to go, and I just skipped the whole workout altogether. I, I've never done that before, but it struck me as completely hilarious that I would actually watch a workout video, but not do anything at all, except just admire those people that look like they were working really hard. <laughs> With, you know, five more reps to go, they're going, oh, you know, I'm thinking, this is really a good way to work out here. Just watch the workout video. Now, we can all laugh at that, but the serious truth is that so many of us as Christians, when we approach God and his word, are acting just like that. We are watching the workout video. We are hearers of the word, but we are not doers of the word. Our bodies are offering no resistance to the tension of how hard it is to obey. We are simply just looking at it and we are admiring it, but we are not perspiring with it. We are uh, happy to look at it and think, oh, that's great, uh, but we are not practicing what we think we affirm. Jesus is not satisfied with us merely admiring the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus does not want to walk down off of that mountain and have a bunch of people that went like this, but no one who does like this. Lots of theories have been put forth by theologians about what is the intention of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Certainly, this is a kingdom ethic. Jesus is calling us to act in accordance with the kingdom he is announcing and proclaiming and um, bringing into reality. And so some people have said, well, you know, that kingdom really won't be established until either the millennium or it's the new heavens and the new earth. And so Jesus is talking about what it will be like uh, in the ideal age somewhere out there, and we certainly can't live that way. However, I don't think we can, anyone can read the Sermon on the Mount closely and pay attention to this conclusion of Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and miss it. 
that Jesus wants us to do it. Certainly the things that he's calling for us to do are very, very difficult. And we cannot fulfill them completely, but that doesn't mean we're supposed to just give up and say, well, Jesus did it in my place and therefore I don't have to do anything. What Jesus wants of us is to be hearers and doers of the word. In fact, he calls people who would not do what they hear foolish. They're like people who admire it and uh, who act like they're doing it, but they haven't really built it on Jesus and his words. This parable at the end of the Sermon on the Mount of these two builders, one on the rock and one on the sand, is trying to point that out. The two houses that are apparently built look very sensible and very similar to one another. Maybe have a beautiful facade. They've got gutters and chimneys and roofs and walls and lots of things inside. But there's a hidden difference between the two houses. The difference is their foundation. One of them is built on the rock, and the other is built on the sand. And there is a storm coming, says Jesus. There is a future test that will test the quality, not of the house itself or the visible properties of it, but will test the very foundation. That test is likened to a storm. The rains will come and the winds will blow and beat upon the house of your life. And the question for you and me is this. Have we built our lives on Jesus, the firm foundation, not just of Jesus himself, but of Jesus' teaching, of what he said we are to build our lives upon? This is the call to action that comes to us in the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus wants us to do more than just watch it. He wants us to act into it. He wants us to put it into practice. If you do not, Jesus calls you a fool. Jesus says that there will be a day when your works will be shown for what they are. And your failure to, to actually do what you've heard will demonstrate that you built on the wrong foundation. And great will be the fall of it. And that it that Jesus is talking about is your very life. It's interesting in Psalm 1 that this is the same kind of portrait that's given to us, that there are there's two people. There's the person who is um, the one who honors God and the person who does not honor God. And uh, the unrighteous, the person who does not honor God, he will be blown away like chaff. But the person who's righteous and does the will of God is the one who will abide and be fruitful and have a life that is substantial. So Jesus calls us to practice what he preaches. This is actually the fourth of four uh, antinomies that Jesus has pointed to us uh, in this conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, We have seen the two paths. Uh, We have seen the two different ways of the two um, fruits that are there, the false prophet and the true prophet. Uh, We've seen the two kinds of outcomes, the I never knew you versus the enter into your master's rest. And now we see that the the means of getting to that place is found here in this fourth contrast, whether we will be hearers of the word only or hearers of the word and doers of it. So I guess that therefore sets up the question, what is it that Jesus actually wants us to do? If you have your Bibles, I want you to continue to keep them open to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Because I believe that what Jesus wants us to do can be understood as we look back to the, f- the big sections of the Sermon on the Mount. And so I want to give a three-point sermon today about what it means to obey Jesus' words. We're going to talk about entering into the kingdom of heaven, internalizing the ethic of the kingdom of heaven, and then pursuing the extent of the reign of the kingdom of heaven. So the first point is this, and it comes from chapter 5, verses 2 through 16 of the Sermon on the Mount. The first way to put Jesus' words into practice is to accept his invitation to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We hear this invitation in the words of the Beatitudes. That's really what they were in the first place. They are an invitation to live a life that is blessed by God. Jesus begins with the first Beatitude by saying these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I recognize that our conversation about the Beatitudes is quite a long time ago, so let me just remind you of a few of the features of the Beatitudes. First of all, of the eight Beatitudes, the beginning and ending of the formal Beatitudes before the ones that talk about persecution 
are both ones that talk about being possessors of the kingdom of heaven. If you look at the, uh, the beatitude that begins in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You hear the symmetry between the first one and that final one over there. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The purpose of the Beatitudes is to invite us into the kingdom of heaven. And we enter into the kingdom of heaven through the gospel. The gospel is the good news of God that we can be saved from our sins and brought into God's kingdom by the mercy of the king who dies for us on the cross and is raised again. This is the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of salvation. You see, the key to understanding the Beatitudes here in this point is this. To accept the terms of the gospel, we have to admit that we are rebels. We have to admit that we've been living in rebellion to God and that in terms of our spiritual aptitude, we are poor. We have a poverty of spirit from which we need to acknowledge and repent. That's why the second beatitude is, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let me ask you this first point of application of Jesus' teaching. Have you accepted his invitation to enter into the kingdom? That's the point of the Sermon on the Mount, first, first without getting any further. We can't do any of the rest of what Jesus is talking about, either by enablement or by intentionality, if we haven't first become beholden and beholders of the kingdom of heaven. The amazing invitation of the kingdom of heaven, though, is that we do it not by striving, but by admitting that all of our striving has been in vain. We come into the kingdom through repentance and faith. We repent of those things that we cannot do. We repent of those dead works that we maybe tried to do, or we repent of those rebellions, all those idolatries we relinquish, and we place our faith and our trust, our allegiance in Jesus as our Savior the one who comes to save us by his mercy. And then we can seek his righteousness and hunger and thirst after his righteousness and be satisfied. That is the process of entering into the kingdom. If you're new or newer to Christianity and kind of wonder what this is all about, this is the very starting point of Christianity. Sometimes we call this being born again or becoming a Christian or putting your faith in Christ. But whatever point in time you come, you need to come through this narrow gate of accepting the fact that you can no longer, accepting the fact that you could never enter the kingdom of heaven by your own merits, but that you have to do it through the king of mercy, the king of grace, who is Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins. So that is the first point of obeying Jesus' teaching. If you want to be a wise person who builds your life in a way that will last, in a way that's wise, then you will accept Jesus' invitation to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And if you've entered into the kingdom of heaven, then welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Now it's time to find out what it looks like to be a people that are kingdom-minded people. Now before we go any further, that raises a question that I think we need to define because sometimes this can get a little bit muddy for us. And it's this question, what actually is the kingdom of heaven? What do we mean by the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? Those two terms are really synonymous. Let me give you just a really basic definition to kind of help you understand what this means because it really unlocks for us what it means to fulfill the the next two points that we're going to talk about. Very simply put, the kingdom of God is the reign of God in the people of God throughout the realm of God. That is to say that the kingdom of God is wherever the king rules and reigns. And the primary means through which he rules and reigns is through his image bearers, the descendants of Adam and Eve, humanity, you and me, his people. And so the kingdom is the reign of God through the people of God whom he has redeemed into the whole realm of God. And that's why we sometimes talk about the kingdom of heaven in terms of the already and the not yet. In some sense, the kingdom of God is already among us. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is within you, in fact, because the rule of God is now inside of you as a person of the people of God. And so the kingdom of God has been established through Christ coming into the world, his proclamation of the kingdom, his death on the cross and his victorious resurrection have established the kingdom of God in and through his people as an act of retaking back this world that was claimed by Satan is now ground that's being regained throughout the earth. But you and I very much know that this kingdom of heaven, which is being established, is still a long ways from being fulfilled. 
That's why there's not only an already, but there's also a not yet. Someday Christ will return and will fulfill all the promises in the largest measure you can imagine of all of the scriptures have talked about, about the rule and reign of God in the earth through his people. And someday the, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Now, some Christians disagree about how extensive that will be before Christ returns, but we do know that it's God's intention for that rule and reign to advance more and more throughout this era of the kingdom. And that that is our call as those who preach the gospel until Christ returns. But when he comes and when he returns, he will defeat every last remaining enemy and put every, foot, every enemy as a footstool under his feet. And that will be the not yet that will someday be reality. And so that is the kingdom of God, the reign of God through the people of God uh, into the entire realm of God. And so wherever we go, we are called to be God's uh, Uh, sovereign ambassadors, extending and living under his rule and then extending the beauty of his rule. Two very wonderful psalms you can go back and look at are Psalm 110, which talks about the enthronement of Jesus as the Son of God, as the one who is the one who establishes the kingdom. And Psalm 72, a very interesting Davidic psalm, which is also a kingship psalm, which talks about the, the peaceable rule and reign of the Messiah. And we don't have time to go back into Psalm 72, but if you want to go and explore that, that will help you understand what this is in terms of the kingdom. All right, so where are we at? What we've said so far is this, that if we're going to be wise, we're going to obey Jesus' teaching and build our lives upon what he said, and not just be hearers, but doers. And the first step of doing that is accepting his invitation to enter into the kingdom of God. And we do that through the gospel, by believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, repenting of our sins, putting our trust in Christ. And now this free gift of salvation means that we've now entered into the kingdom. But the amazing thing is now there's two more steps because we're not done yet. If we want to build our lives on Jesus, it's not just enough to get in at the narrow gate. We have to go down through the narrow path. So the second point that I want to say is this. We are called to internalize the ethics of Christ's kingdom. And Jesus makes another kingdom statement uh, that goes parallel with chapter 5, verse 2, the first one being, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, with the standard of those who will be partakers of the kingdom. Look with me at uh, chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus says these words, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, what's he talking about here? I thought we just said that it's a free gift and you can enter in by having a mournful poverty of spirit. And now we're hearing that to enter the kingdom of heaven, we've got to be super righteous. What does this mean? Well, I think what Jesus is talking about is that our salvation is a free gift. But that work that God has begun by saving us continues into the work of transformation by his indwelling Holy Spirit and that those who are truly saved, as we talked about last week, will bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That is to say that no one who's saved by this faith alone will observe in their life that faith is alone. That faith will be accompanied by those good works. And the test of that is that our righteousness will go deep. When Jesus says our righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, he doesn't mean that we've got to be even more meticulous about all of our observances than were the scribes and Pharisees, but rather that there's an internal, centered, true righteousness that abides in us. That we don't just kind of trim across all the weeds, but we actually uproot the weeds and we deal with the things at their core level. And so the amazing thing about the gospel here in the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus tells us that by the work of the Holy Spirit, He is promising to transform us from one degree of glory to another. And we are called to internalize the ethical expectations of the kingdom of heaven by the power of the Spirit as we put to death the deeds of the flesh and we live by this resurrection power in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're called to internalize the ethics of the kingdom. Now, Jesus gives a number of examples, doesn't he, in chapter 5, beginning in verse uh, 21 and following. Jesus talks about the problem of anger, that it's simply not enough to just not murder people. We have to actually go to the root of what causes murder, which is anger, and we have to pull up the root, the taproot of anger that is sending its tentacles into every area of our life, our family, our relationships, and into our culture. This is the kind of internalization of the ethic of the kingdom that Jesus wants. 
Jesus talks about the fact that it's not enough to just say that you didn't or not commit adultery in the ultimate sense or physical sense, but you have to go to the root of what's behind adultery. And Jesus says you can't even look at a woman with lustful intent. If you do that, you are breaking the commandment against adultery. Jesus talks about divorce and our words and our oaths, about retaliation and loving our enemies. And Jesus is not satisfied with a surface, prima facie uh, understanding of the law just to kind of go, okay, I just kind of did the basics and check them off the list and I'm good to go. What Jesus wants of us is he wants us to actually become transformed from the inside out. That's why in one of those final calls about uh, knowing uh, those true or false teachers by their fruits, Jesus talks about the analogy of fruit. You see, you and I are like a tree, and when we're rooted in the gospel, we become a good tree that bears good fruit. The problem with the Pharisees and tax collectors and uh, the Pharisees and all those other people, the scribes and the Pharisees, is that they were just taking the fruit and kind of stapling it onto the branches. (laughs) And Jesus sees through that. He goes, look, this is actually not real fruit. It's plastic. It doesn't taste very good. This is a fake kind of fruit. You've got to go down to the root and drink from the deep, satisfying work of salvation in Christ, of sanctification by the Holy Spirit, and then you're going to bear fruit. What we all know about bearing fruit is that this is not an instantaneous process. For some of us, when we first came to Christ or at some points in our Christian journey, there are certain sins that we suddenly just let go of really fast. But there are other ones that we are going to be prevailing or besetting sins, and it's going to take an all-out war in our sanctification through Christ to fight against that sin. But Jesus is calling us to go from merely the words of salvation into the reality of transformation. This is what it means to build our lives on him. To not be satisfied with the surface, but to go deep into what it is he wants us to do. Now, if this is not your life, then you got to go back to step one. You have to go back and say, uh, Lord, I recognize that I am so poor in spirit. I, I try to do these things, but I don't, um, I don't live them out. Uh, search me and uh, know if there's any way unpleasing in me and guide me in paths of righteousness. And so there's a continual process of um, seeking to obey and uh, confessing for those places where we have failed. So the third thing we want to do after having entered uh, the kingdom through the gospel Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And internalizing the ethic of Christ's kingdom, that unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, we shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The third thing that the Sermon on the Mount of what Jesus is teaching us says is that we must pursue the establishment of the kingdom. And this begins at the beginning of chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. The center of this whole two-chapter or chapter-and-a-half passage about seeking the establishment of the kingdom is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, if you want a quick summary of the three points of the Sermon on the Mount, you could underline chapter 5, verse 2, chapter 5, verse 20, and here, chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus tells us that the center of what he wants our lives to be all about, having entered into the kingdom and having been transformed into kingdom citizens, is that we're now called to use every resource at our disposal to extend the rule and the reign of the people of God, which is the reign of God, into the world that God possesses and is coming to repossess from his arch enemy, Satan. And so Jesus tells us in chapter 6 that we're supposed to do things that are um, observances, not to be seen by men, but to build up the kingdom. We're not supposed to give to the needy so that we can be seen and so that we can receive the applause of men. We're supposed to give to the needy because that extends the reality of the generous king into his kingdom. We're called to be like God in his mercy and be merciful to others. We're supposed to also pray for the kingdom, aren't we? That's exactly what Jesus goes into this next point about prayer. Don't pray just to be seen in religious activity. No, the kingdom is so much more than religious observance and religious activity. Now, let me just pause here for a second because this is really important. I think for us as Christians, especially those of us who attend worship regularly and are pretty committed to the church, it's easy to let religious activity substitute for the action and the activity of the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. It's easy for us who are regular Christians to 
um, let the activity substitute for, or in religious activity, to substitute for pushing it out into the rest of the world, into the, all of our lives. You see, every part of our life is part of the domain and the realm of God. We as people are called to be under God's rule, not just in one hour in a worship service because we're worshipers, but in every domain of life because we are disciples. And so we're called to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everywhere on earth, not just within the four walls of the church, but everywhere we go, everywhere that all believers are extending the rule and reign of Jesus. And Jesus wants us, as we even look at the act of prayer, to focus our prayerful attention on this most important petition, that the kingdom of God would be established. Look with me back at the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, even in prayer, our first priority is not our needs or our comforts or the prayer list that we receive that are important things that God cares about, but the top priority that Jesus points us to that should be uh, a facet of all of our prayer should be that we are pursuing his kingdom. We are praying for his kingdom to be established. We are asking for power from on high to see the extent of the rule and reign of Jesus everywhere we go so that the reign of God in the people of God into the realm of God can be established more and more. That is top priority for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he wants us as his kingdom citizens to care for that as well. We're supposed to pursue the kingdom of heaven. We're supposed to lay up treasure in heaven. We're supposed to endeavor to put our lives in such a way that the kingdom of heaven is our continual pursuit and priority, that this is the work of Christ now through Christians all around the world. Jesus, of course, will focus in chapter 7 about our relationships and judging others, and we need to make sure that our relationships are in line with the kingdom. But let me just go back to the end of chapter 6 for just a moment, because I think Jesus points us to something that's so important for us here in the 21st century, here in the West. Worry. You know, when we worry and we, we fret about what we don't have, we try to amass and collect and hold on to everything. But this is a besetting thing that keeps us from pursuing it. It uh, focuses our mind on what we eat and what we drink, what we wear, what we do, how we preserve our lives. And Jesus has come to set us free. And that is the context in which he says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. You know, the test that we will someday face before the Lord won't just simply be, did you enter into my kingdom? And did you have the ethic of my kingdom? But did you care about my kingdom? Someday when we stand before the judge, he's going to want to know. He's going to ask us directly, what did you do with the resources and gifts I gave you to extend the thing that I love the most, my kingdom in this world? Were you, were you on mission with me or were you kind of just sidelined? Were you, were you pursuing the kingdom? Were you seeking first the kingdom of heaven? Or were you seeking third or fourth the kingdom of heaven? This is what Jesus calls us to as we seek to be obeying and doing his word. So let me give you one point of uh, follow-through, one kind of point of application as we think about what we're talking about here in this message today. I want to encourage you to do the following. I want you to go back and look through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, maybe read through all three chapters, maybe in one sitting, or maybe um, as you have time throughout the week, with an eye to looking for one thing. What is the one point in the sermon that you believe you need to put into action? Just choose one thing. Don't try to do all of the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe it'll help you to follow this framework of uh, accepting the invitation into the kingdom and then moving into being transformed into the ethic of the kingdom and then pursuing the kingdom. Maybe in that journey, you're, you're moving along the progression of where you're at as a kingdom citizen, and you're ready to really uh, pursue, now that you've internalized the ethic of the kingdom, now you're really ready to push out the, the extent of the kingdom. Whatever it is, I want you to look back and find just one thing that Jesus is calling you to do for his glory. Just take one step. It can be overwhelming if we feel like we have to face too many things at once. But uh, if we uh, take one thing and put it into practice, then we can go forward by his grace and for his glory. So 
This is the summary of the message of the Sermon on the Mount, the thing that we're called to put into practice. Number one, we're called to enter the kingdom, accept the gospel invitation as it's been given. Secondly, we're called to internalize the ethic of the kingdom, to pursue gospel transformation. Thirdly, we're called to pursue the establishment of the kingdom, gospel expansion. Those who are wise, those who love Jesus, will obey his word and not just be hearers only. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you've given us this wonderful summary of what it means to enter your kingdom, to be transformed into participants, as citizens of your kingdom, and to establish the extent and reign and rule of Jesus throughout your kingdom as we proclaim the gospel and as we act as citizens of the kingdom. Lord, we pray that you will give us power by your Holy Spirit to act on these things, to be those like those wise builders who build our entire life on you and your revealed word to us. We thank you that you have all authority in heaven and on earth and have commanded us to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe everything you've commanded. We thank you that you're with us even to the very end of the age. And so we ask for your power and your help as we seek to be doers of your word. In Jesus' name.